Yes. Okay. Um, so, welcome everyone to um, the building committee meeting and school board workshop um, via Zoom at 6.30 on December 8th, 2020. It's really nice to have you. We have 30 panelist members here. Um, some of those panelists are uh, Austin Smith from The Architects and Julia, um, I'm forgetting your last name, Tate. And uh, we have some of the engineers here. Scott Simons is here as well. Welcome, Scott. Um, we have Callan Colby here. Um, and I think I saw James Hubert was here as well. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, of course, there's teachers. There are um, there are members of the community. There are staff members and board members here as well. We're up to a total of 32 panelists. Um, so thank you again for being here. We've been in this process for just about a year, um, close to that. So um, I'd like us to start with um, the goals from the strategic plan. Um, again, the strategic plan was developed <clears throat> by more than 100 community members um, and then whittled down over a weekend workshop to come up with four, excuse me, five goals um, of how to move the district forward in the next five years. And I'm not gonna go into details, but just review the, the headlines of it. One is health and well being. Next one is global competency. Another one is multiple pathways and definitions of success. Safe, sustainable, and effective facilities um, and environmental responsibilities. So those are the five strategic plan goals. I'd also like to say that uh, the school board um, also has uh, three goals for this year that are particular to the school board. Um, and one of them is to support the building committee. So it's an important aspect of our district as well as the school board. Um, Donna, do you have the building committee charge handy to read I do. out? Yeah, I do. The charge is to review the needs of the assessment report, to determine priorities, to determine the size and scope of a future building project and bond, and then make a recommendation to the school board. Okay, so we're getting close to the point of making a recommendation to the school board. Um, back um, in February, the um, architects and engineers approached us after quite a bit of time. I would say originally before Superintendent Wolfram was here, we had um, an interim superintendent Howard Coulter, and we started the conversations. Um, so this is quite a few years ago now, and it stemmed from the need of safety within the entrance of Pond Cove in the middle school and the cafetorium, the cafeteria theater area that is shared by both the middle school and the Pond Cove. And so that was the stepping stone to begin this process. And as we um, moved into a little bit more an analysis and conversation back in February, 2020, after the architects and the engineers did a little bit of digging, they came up with four options. Um, and these options, they said, by no means were the only options. They were a place to start. Um, and I keep looking at Austin and Kellen because you are in my view and please step in if I misspeak or um, misrepresent here. Um, and I just, I don't want to go into too much detail about what each of these options are because we have discussed them quite a bit over the past year um, and we're down to two. Um, so what I want to remind people is that we initially started um, earlier this fall with um, knocking away option four, which was that original plan to just focus on the entryway and um, the cafetorium upgrade. Uh, I think the belief was that it was too much of a Band-Aid. Um, we realized that there's too much more that needs to be done. Um, and the price tag was a little too much for that kind of work. Um, last meeting, we uh, decided, we voted out option three, 
which was frame off restoration and renovation of the existing lower and middle schools. Um, and so that leads option one and two, which we will be discussing tonight. And those two options, if I'm understanding them correctly, and again, we have the experts here to help sort of uh, clarify all of that, is that we have decided to uh, go for new buildings with Pond Cove in the middle school. And my understanding is that the idea is that it be spread out over a shorter time versus a longer time period. That's the difference between the two options. Um, I like the thumbs up, Callum. Thank you, keep doing that. Um, and I think what many people that I've spoken to and is on my mind as well is that within this conversation has to be the high school as well. We cannot put the high school in the conversation for a complete renovation currently. Pond Cove and the middle school um, appear by our experts to have the greatest need, but it does not mean that we're forgetting the high school. We would like to put some money into the high school as we do these, the project for the middle school and Pond Cove to help get the high school to the point where we can then do a more thorough job. Um, so whatever we craft as a recommendation to the school board needs to have that included so that doesn't forget, uh, get lost. And the point being that I wanna make super clear um, is that school boards change over um, and shift and at the point when the high school becomes renovated or at their time's up, it will most likely be a different leadership here in the school board. And so we want that clear and part of the work that we're doing now, that that is expected to be worked on in the future. Um, but right now we're having a conversation tonight about hopefully, um, I will put this out there, my hope, is to be able to use this two hours and come up with uh, a recommendation um, that we can bring to the school board. Now that may not happen and I'm open to the flexibility, um, but I did hear from many people that it's time to get it going. Um, we have had quite a bit of discussion. And so I am hopeful that uh, the discussion that we have tonight can um, sort of finalize things. I want us to remember as we go ahead with these discussions, a few things. Um, this is a recommendation to the board. Um, there is a lot more that happens after this process. Um, and we are supposed to take the high viewpoint. We are not supposed to be the experts with the finances, um, knowing all details. And by no means are we supposed to decide what the townspeople think they can handle as far as debt. We take on the information from our, our uh, Matt Sturgis, our town manager, and the information that we learned tonight. Um, and we cannot assume one way or the other according to the townspeople. That will be the voting of the bond. So we have to go a recommendation based on what we see is the need for these buildings and then move forward from there. And I'm hoping that we will get some uh, information from the architects and the engineers about the process of getting us to the bonding and how, how we have direction uh, the future lies ahead um, for the next stages of this process. Um, so that was quite a bit that I shared. I am open to board members or um, architects or Donna or anyone who feels like they have something Okay, wow, I did it then. All right, so let's uh, go ahead. That was the review of the charge and then the review of where we are to date. Um, and I guess before we go forward as well, I just wanna really thank everybody for all the dedicated time and energy they have put into this. Um, I think it ended up being a lot longer process than we expected. Um, and there's multiple reasons to that, but I deeply wanna say thank you. 
um, for continually showing up to these meetings. Um, so next up is Matt with further information on future bonding projects and retirement bonds, impacts of changing interest rates. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to, uh, to be here this evening and uh, happy holidays to all. I did uh, do some additional work from the last time that we gathered and uh, hopefully this will at least provide some, uh, I guess in many ways a framework or different ideas that you may want to consider as you do go forward with, uh, you know, with the decision tree. And I did a couple of items uh, since, since, we, uh, since we spoke a couple of weeks ago. And one of the items we wanted to look at was retirement of debt service that is over the next, uh, really all of our debts, what we're looking at for retirement over the time period of what, the window within which we have it and when that's coming offline and uh, what that impact is going to be cumulative over the next, let's say 15 years. And then the other item is uh, looking at uh, what different interest rates may have for impacts going forward. So uh, right now, let's say uh, when we met two weeks ago, I was looking at a pro forma uh, debt service of like uh, two and a half percent over a 30 year term and what that impact would be on a median assessed home and an average assessed home under the current snapshot of time that we exist in. And so you can see the impacts from that and based on, you know, some uh, different debt levels of 40 million, 50 million, 60, 70, up to 80 million. And then uh, based on some of the discussions that we had, uh, also thought, okay, if the board looked at something along the lines of phasing it in or taking on debt at different windows, uh, what would that impact be looking to uh, that debt relative to changing interest rates? So what I did was I took the same parameters, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 million, and then same term looking at a 30 year window, but uh, at different interest rates. So I originally started at two and a half percent, then I went to three, three and a half, four, four and a half, up to 5%. And if we're looking at perhaps say a five year window, six year window, seven year window, we may be looking in that range, and that's you know that's a snapshot in time, um, December eighth, uh, twenty twenty. Uh, things could stay the same; they could change. I have a feeling that you know over time, uh, the bond rates will increase. Uh, but I think five is a is a decent ceiling to use, and two and a half is a decent floor. I think it's conservative at this time, based on we just uh, did a five year lease purchase this past spring at one point two six nine. I think it was a two set. Uh, maybe two seven, but right in that range, which is historically low uh, to say the least. But uh, so we employed that this past spring. Uh, so without further ado, what I can do is I'll I'll share my screen if that's a, if that's fine, Madam Chair. And let's see, we'll use we'll look at the we'll look at the debt service one first. Uh, so I'll just I'll get that one to share. And let's see, here we are. So, uh, everybody see that okay? Awesome, okay. Uh, so what, what we have here is, uh, this is all the debt that the town has. Now, this is a pretty big spreadsheet uh, that we've had for years uh, to pull together. Uh, it, it shows, there's the total, if you look up from re reading left to right, that's the total school amount of debt uh, followed by the town and then the sewer fund. And then you've got the grand total amounts. And then finally, uh, the total of everything, total principal and interest, which is where my cursor is here. And so uh, what we're looking at here on the furthest column over is the change year over year. Uh, so what I mean by that is that, so the top number there that we have, the total principal and interest or total P&I is $2,681,400. And that, oh, 352, I just rounded up. Uh, it's the holidays, why not? Um, so. That is what our current principal and interest payment is gonna be across the board for this year, for next year's uh, budget. So looking at the following year, we, we're dropping off 238,900. As we retire debt, that's the impact that it's gonna take place. So two years out, it's gonna be 413,000. As some of the debts, as you can see across from left to right, uh, they cumulatively start, start to fall off. And so, when it's all said and done in fiscal year 2037 or 15 years from now, uh, we're looking at uh, no more debt, uh, at least based on what we currently have. 
that that is uh, saying that we pay for everything outright in cash or uh, don't borrow again. And the total savings over that 15 years is going to be two million four hundred forty-two thousand six hundred, and that's the amount that's coming off uh, that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. So that being said, that kind of gives you an idea. So if you add like next year, if you uh, next year we, we won't have to raise as much to satisfy our debt in the year after that and the year after that so that that kind of gives you a flavor as to how that is being retired and there's a couple uh, a couple of big ones there that drop off over the next you know uh, what we have in 23 is uh, we have roughly the debt service from a five-year bond from when we purchased uh, the ladder truck uh, yep it's going on five years ago or at least took on that debt from five years ago and then uh, the 470 that comes off that year is going to be the bonded debt that uh, the, the lease purchase numbers that came off last year or they came on last year so that, that will be retiring so uh, that's you know you can see a couple of those swings that take place over the next few years and then after that it's it's generally conservative as it drops off which which is not a bad thing because you see that our debt load as well uh, is shrinking considerably over the next uh, two four six over the next six years and then it really starts to drop off uh, from where we are today. So we are in a decent sign as far as the next five, six years, as far as what our debt load uh, level is. Okay, so that's, that is that is uh, that one there. And then I have another spreadsheet and this is an update from the one I did uh, two weeks ago, or I've had this for quite a while, but uh, updated a couple weeks ago. Can everybody see that one okay? Uh, the change okay just want to make sure it changed on your screen uh, so all in all you see uh, like the meat of this shows a 30-year bond impact now as i scroll up to the top here you, you'll see across the top you have uh, average home value uh, the tax amount median home value and the tax amount so uh, that's that's today uh, that's what we're looking at today for for uh, for a tax load on, in Cape Elizabeth. And then on the far left is the same as we had a couple weeks ago as well, which is this year's operating budget. <clears throat> now, uh, excuse me, looking at what we have for uh, on the rest of the spreadsheet. Now you, you may find the two and a half percent column here. This is what we were looking at a couple weeks ago. And this is a 30 year bond at two and a half percent interest um, with that annual payment uh, being made. And so uh, the tax rate impact on that, so if you added $40 million in debt, uh, it would add $2.34. Uh, and then to a median home, that would add $771 in taxes and on an average home, roughly over a <coughs> thousand. Excuse me. And then as you see, uh, rotating through there, it, get, it gets greater and greater, the, the higher numbers of debt that you're looking at. Now, uh, one of the questions was, okay, so what, let's say we wait and five years, we stagger it. And, and this year we do, let's say a $60 million or, or within this, within phase one here, or we look at doing, let's say a, uh, a $60 million improvement or taking out 60 million in debt. Well, if it, it was at two and a half percent, you'd be looking at roughly $950 on a median home and about $1,250 on an average home. And that's that would be going forward. Uh, of course, there are, that does offset when you look at the other numbers that we just looked at that drop off. Uh, but that is uh, that's going to show you pretty much where where you're looking at there for impact. And then let's say five years from now or six years from now, you say, okay, well we we're ready to go to phase two. That's going to be another fifty million dollars, and that's at let's say four percent. That's going to have an impact of. <clears throat> and then if you look over to the right and then down one column you'll see that 4% number. And let's say that's gonna add about $2.87 to the tax rate and about $950 again, and about $1,250 to the average home. So that kind of gives you what you're looking at if you, if you stagger it as well. And then uh, of course, if you wanted to go greater, we can we can do those numbers as well. If, if you wanted to look at all all at one, we can, uh, we can always figure that debt service out if it was a greater amount, say it was in excess of 80 or something greater than that, we can figure that debt service out as well fairly fairly quickly. But hopefully, this will give you uh, uh, gives you kind of an idea as to what you know what those rates may have for an impact, as well as uh, as well as what the uh, the debt service that we do have coming off. And I'll I'll send both of these to Jen 
and to Donna to, to put up as a PDF uh, and share with the group. Uh, we've been, uh, I would have tried to get it out a little bit earlier, but it, this does take a while to uh, to process as well. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. And then I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions as always, if that's, if that's uh, what you're looking for, Madam Chair. Uh, no, that is great information, and thank you for compiling it and taking your time to put it together. Um, and I do, um, I am grateful that you'll pass it on to John and Jen for them to post it um, for the public to to take a look at and notice. Um, are there any questions? I'm wondering. Um, okay, I see Valerie. Thanks. I'm still navigating. I'm not a pro at um, <laughs> the whole Zoom, but I did see Valerie. Uh, Devereaux, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, for that uh, presentation. I'm just curious, how likely is it that um, we're not going to borrow any money between now and 2035? Highly on. Okay, so, so those projections are not really that That's like, accurate. That is, uh, it's it's completely project specific when, when you're looking at this impact. Uh, we we will be looking. You know, so, so part of the picture, looking at this all is sewer, for instance. At some point in time, the town will be looking to expand the sewer system that we have. There are neighborhoods that would benefit from having an expansion. Uh, into the service, it would help the, you know, the system has capacity. Uh, we'll be looking at something along those lines. That's generally paid for and supported by uh, the fees that are assessed to your, you know, to a monthly ceiling, uh, monthly sewer, sewer service fees. So that, my, that my immediately pays for itself. Okay, um, don't mean to interrupt you. No, my understanding fine. is we're looking at the Shore Road Rehabilitation Project, and that's a pretty big price tag. Um, so that's going to be figured in there. And then we have other projects we kind of put on the table. So um, <coughs> once we start that shore road project, that's going to add a lot of money to our debt. That could probably be somewhere in the three and a half to five million dollar range. Um, so what you might look at at that point in time is combining it as then that's what the town has also done in the past as well. So if you did go out to a full uh, referendum because you will be going to a referendum for any type of large debt like this uh, you would put that out to the voters and it'd be best at that point to package everything together so but in comparison to the larger numbers that we're looking at here in the 40 50 60 70 80 range uh, that is you're talking five to ten percent of what that of what that uh, that debt load would be so the impact don't take me wrong Councilor Devereaux it's still a lot of money, so I'm not I'm not uh, downplaying the impact of that uh, of that expenditure. It's just uh, in comparison to the larger ticket, it's a uh, it's it's a small small end of the spectrum. But it it would be wise at that point to to book that all together at that point in time, such as has been done with the library and improvements that have taken place uh, with school projects in the past as well. We generally tried to maximize our uh, opportunity with that and consolidating uh, projects together at the same time, especially if you can find a favorable rate. But that those would be the, the next two larger items in the next few years that would come on as far as taking on that type of debt. There may be smaller term or a shorter term debt uh, that, that the town may, in, may incur, uh, you know, when we have to replace a fire truck or a large, uh, large ticket capital items, uh, but that's generally short term and, uh, and short interest that we do uh, as a model for for paying for that, so uh, that that does come on on occasion, but it comes off much quicker than the long term uh, bonded indebtedness. All right, thanks, Matt. You're very welcome. Um, Elizabeth, you have your hand raised. Thank you. I kind of wanted to piggyback off what um, Councillor Devereaux was talking about, and um, ask if what you know how whatever the outcome is um, from this committee I think that um, the finance subcommittee that has um, school board and town council members and the uh, finance director and yourself Mr. Sturgis um, I think that it would be wise for that group to work together to 
look at the big picture for um, bonding different projects. I wanted to um, refer, I mean, I know you know about, you know, the different projects that Yarmouth has done in different ways to, you know, vote on bonds. And if you vote for this, and that means you also approve that and we're folding in um, town projects and school projects and that sort of thing. But I think it would be prudent for the school board and the town council to work together to have that big picture to you know have the best interests of the town in mind as we go forward with um, the very necessary projects ahead of us so that's just um, a recommendation or a request for you know that working together um, because i think that councillor devro raises a good point i i would completely agree uh with you as well, I think uh, I think that's been uh, a hallmark of, of recent of the recent years is a great level of com communication and collaboration between the school board and the and the council as well. I think uh, they've tried to keep everything on. You know, it's not two radar screens; it's one big radar screen that we all operate out of, and uh, in, in this one tax bill that goes to folks. So I think uh, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Phil. You have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Matt, I was wondering if you could just share that screen one more time. I had a question about the mill rate calculations. <clears throat> so I just want to make sure it's, um, I am clear because it's sort of stunning is that if you, just for sake of argument, the, the hypo you gave, which was if we were to just hypothetically break it up into two projects and you had a $50 million project one year and a $40 million project another or $50, or $50 million project later on down the road that it's almost to, to break it up that way if I'm reading correctly it's an almost two point mill rate difference addition in other words if you were to break it up rather than just say this first year if you take 80 million um, 3.1 versus if you do 2.61 one year and you do 2.87 another year. In other words, it's much more expensive to break it up into two pieces, even though not getting, you know, there's gonna be a hurdle to talk about this larger number um, in terms of referendum, but it seems to me that it's significantly less impact on the taxpayer to do a larger one. Am I reading that correct, the math correctly? You are right on, especially, uh, well, this is a great opportunity to, to learn uh, the impact of interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite frankly, because if you look at that as you break it up, it, if you look at two and a half and then maybe look at three and a half, uh, a few years later, all of a sudden you can see your 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 change. Let's say if you did 60, it went from uh, 288, basically it's a 20 cent uh, twenty cent change at that point in time, uh, just right. by adding a, adding a point in interest. So, uh, and it is, yeah, it, it could over time, you got, you're gonna end up paying more, more in debt, the, uh, you know, with a higher interest rate, so it, it does kind of it does provide an impact there, and, and more by breaking it up in two as well is sort of my yep. point. Yeah, yep. yep you okay, can, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing hands and I'm not. Um, okay. Well, thank you for that presentation. Thank you for the questions from the committee members. Um, we're gonna move on now to the descriptions of options one and two. Um, the possible one building option, um, high school renovations, which I alluded to uh, before. Um, and I just wanna sort of remind everybody, I didn't mention this um, in my introduction, but currently the Pond Cove and Middle School are one building. They're just a very funky shape. Um, and um, so, so we're gonna have that conversation about the one building option that was talked about a little bit last meeting. So I'm gonna hand it over to, I don't know which one is going to start. James, it uh, looks like you're ready to go. Yes, if you would mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Good evening, everyone. And uh, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, bear with me for one moment. Yeah. Uh, right. Does everyone see this? Yes. Yeah. All yeah. right, great. All right, so a lot of uh, some of these slides you will you will have seen before from our previous presentations, but I think it would be worthwhile since we've been going through this just to kind of give us our, give ourselves a refresh on where where we're going and where we've been. Um, as Heather mentioned, Kaylin Colby, Scott Simons, Austin Smith, and Julie Tate are joining me with uh, joining us tonight as well to help answer questions from the committee. Uh, and as you summarize uh, the brief history of uh, where we started and, and and where we have ended up. Um, in the fall of 2017, it started with uh, the, the former um, the former temporary superintendent, um, Mr. Howard, as far as asking us to come in to look at security and uh, the cafetorium situation, and that at the uh, lower and middle school, and that evolved into looking at all of all of the facilities and a needs assessment, which we completed this past fall. Um, and as we go forward, uh, you know, lots of uh, questions with regard to construction considerations, you know, do we don't really want to have any portable teaching facilities and uh, with options one and two, there wouldn't be, um, there wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary to have any portables uh, or portable classrooms rather, which you would uh, have to uh, work with is most likely a temporary loss of a few athletic fields in that general area, speaking to the lower and middle school um, locations as well as some parking lots. Uh, the construction would be phased to minimize school disruption in any event. Um, and with the, with the new construction, it allows for your maximum energy savings. You know, you could build a better building uh, and build it to uh, withstand the next 50, 60 years. Uh, so the phasing that we're looking at for uh, a K through A school, this is option one. Um, this is the uh, phase where we're breaking it up into two different bonds to, to um, ease the burden of the initial bond impact, uh, though it is, it is note per our memorandum that we had shared with you folks last month, um, the cost for this of, of this op of this option for option one is higher than option two because um, you are basically building two. Uh, you're building a building now. You're waiting for a period of time that time to be determined, and then you're uh, taking another bond to finish this re finish the project. And so the phasing for this option uh, for this option would be say for in, we had to pick a time in order to start this timeline for it because we know a question would be well how what what would a possible timeline of this look like um, and if you wanted to start with uh, bond support documentation the schematic design level that we had talked about previously uh, if you started that within June 2020 um, you would have a design. A schematic design level that you could submit for bidding or excuse me not for bidding but you would have a design and a cost that you would allow that would allow you to size an appropriate bond that would be voted on the following year um, and then the following year after that uh, march 2022 essentially as soon as the ground thaws and construction is able to take place uh, we would the idea would be to build a new middle school in this existing athletic field that's currently it, it is an athletic field that would be temporarily unusable unusable for a period of time, but that seems like the most uh, ideal footprint for a future middle school building to go in this area, only because uh, you would have the least impact to the other schools and and on the campus. So phase one of this of this option, you would construct a new middle school. The athletic field would be relocated. Um, what you would do is at the existing 1930s schoolhouse would be remain would remain. Uh, we imagine that there would be a historical significance significance of the building, and the town would want to keep that building there. When the middle school uh, is completed, slightly different from what we had explained previously. What we would what we would propose with the situation is you take those middle school students from the existing middle school and move them to the new middle school, have them go into the new school that they are going to be in uh, for the long term, and relocate the lower school uh, students to the existing middle school. There would be some rehabilitation and some renovation that would have to take place in the existing middle school to facilitate the lower school transferring into that building for a period of time. Um, 
and then the phase two of this project would be to demolish the existing uh, Pond Cove building, you would construct a new lower school. And as the new lower school is constructed and completed, the lower school students that are currently in the existing middle school would then go to their permanent homes in the, in the new lower school and the existing middle school would be demolished. And in there, there would be a, constructed a new shared space. And these shared spaces uh, include um, uh, cafeterias, uh, auditoriums, and so on. Um, and that space between these two options could be 10 years it could be eight years or seven years that would be that would that's more of a uh, um, a planning uh, decision that would be made further in the design process Oops, excuse me uh, so with option two this is replacing the k-8 through school lower and middle all at once you would you would essentially still do the same it would be the same process you would construct a middle school the middle school students would populate it. The lower school students would populate the existing middle school for most likely a year or so. The lower school would be demolished and reconstructed. And once that is complete, the lower school students would go back into their, uh, into their new home and the new lower school and the sh a new shared space, your cafeterias, your uh, auditoriums and so on would be constructed and the existing middle school would be demolished. This allows you to, uh, the option two is the, it's the quickest and most efficient way to get you to your final destination. Uh, and also noted in the, in the previous uh, memo last month, it's, it, it will save you um, a, sig a significant amount of money. I mean, every, uh, we're, we're, when we're talking about dollars, everything is, is significant. Um, so the process of this scenario, options one and two are the same. The difference is option one would take a significant amount of time longer, whether that's five years, eight years, or 10 years. Um, so the hypothetical phasing, looking more um, into how this is sort of structured, this is the existing lower and middle school now. You would build a, a new middle school uh, in the athletic field that's existing there. I want to caveat uh, right now, um, everything that we're showing here is again very conceptual it's very hypothetical and is not meant to be taken um be taken as the only option this is just a, a straightforward uh approach that we were looking at copying the existing square footage and quantities of spaces in the lower and middle school and applying them here so what you're looking at in this middle school uh image on the left would be uh you know a two or a three level in some places um uh, for the middle school. And once that is completed, the middle school students would go there. And during this time, the existing cafeteria would remain because you would need to have that space in operation while everything is, is being constructed. Um, the temporary middle school uh, drop off at entry during construction that would be created uh, in the upper left hand corner near the Scott Dyer Road entry. Uh, the new school will be occupied by the middle school students. You would have your current cafeteria would remain with it all as uh, for all students in the schools and the lower school drop off would remain in this corner here for the duration of construction. Um, then you have your once the lower school students have relocated into the existing middle school, you remove Pond Cove um, and the idea of again, looking at uh, keeping Pond Cove on this side of the campus is because of the, uh, one of the items is the newer uh, playground that was constructed there last year. So we wanna kind of keep the flow of the campus the same. Um, the other uh, location that we looked at would be in the middle of the two buildings right now. And there are significant grade issues where um, it, it could possibly be a location, but it would most likely be a more uh, increasing cost just due to uh, the amount of fill that would have to be brought in. So looking at the uh, hypothetical phasing, uh, you would have you would have the new lower school being constructed in this location, still connected to portions of the existing middle school. Uh, but now with the new lower school in place, you can start to demo and take away portions of the school to come to your final, uh, however this building would look, you would remove the existing school. Uh, the cafeteria will remain as long as it is needed. Um, and in this here, you see that, you know, you have a, uh, as we had spoken about with option four, um, several iterations ago, 
the idea of combining services. You would have one performing arts uh, auditorium that would be shared between the two schools. You would have one large kitchen with separate dining areas that would serve both schools. Um, one point that I wanted to mention, and also uh, uh, Scott, Austin, Julia, Kalen, please feel free to jump in. Um, with this option here, this is really one building, one school. Uh, when you're looking at, say, what if we did a standalone K through eight building, in a way you have that now, um, only to, you would have to sep physically separate these buildings and provide separate electrical services and water services and fuel sources and boiler rooms in order to have these as separate buildings where because of the footprint of the building now and where it is situated on the campus, it really is going to remain as, as, as one building as it currently is now. Um, you would just be sharing performing arts center. You would be sharing uh, the cafeteria. It wouldn't be a cafetorium anymore. Um, and then again, looking at the high school, the we we were focusing all of the conversation here on the lower and middle school for now. But obviously, uh, with respect to the high school. Uh, there would be renovations to take place to look at it infrastructurally and to make sure that that does indeed last another 15 years or so to take it to its end of life that we had discussed uh, previously. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Um, I apologize if I put any, anybody to sleep. Um, my, my voice can be somewhat monotonous at times. Um, um, James, Marianne Lynch has raised her hand. Yes, please, Marianne. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Can you tell me what the square feet of the footprint of the proposed new buildings are and the square feet of the footprint of what we're replacing? Yeah, I, I would ask um, uh, Julia or Austin, if you wouldn't mind looking, I don't have that number right in front of me at this moment, but I believe that this footprint here uh, being second level, we try to keep the square footage the same as the current buildings that you have now. Uh, in addition, trying to keep the quantities of the, the rooms together as the same as well. We wouldn't necessarily, uh, a design wouldn't necessarily propose to have the classrooms and rooms oriented as they are now through a central corridor on either side. Um, this is again, just for diagrammatic purposes, but I believe, and Julie and Austin, please correct me if I'm wrong, the square footage of this is relatively the same to what is currently in place. And we did that just because we don't know uh, through the schematic design process is an analysis of the program with the teachers. You know, do you, does this classroom really need this certain X amount of square footage? Does it need more or does it need less? Uh, we're, there are discussions as, you know, potentially the new, a, a new structure, a new building could have less square footage than what you have now. Again, d d based on your current enrollment, what you're projecting, a uh, number of classrooms that you're, you're foreseeing that you're going to be needing in the future. Uh, so the, those items have been taken into account, but I believe that the square footage here is based on a two-story structure, what you're looking at now, uh, and the square footage is relative uh, to the existing structure. I would agree, James. Um, we do realize some efficiency. The plan does become more, uh, uh, again, more efficient, uh, but we do add the spaces for separate dining rooms for lower school and middle school. Um, we do have more support space for uh, the Performing Arts Center. Um, and, um, and we do have separate gyms as well, which you currently have. But um, there is some increase in square footage, but also some efficiency. Uh, Julia, do you want to comment on that as well? I I was just referring back actually to our previous presentation, and we we did a, an analysis that essentially looked at the elementary school, middle school, and high school, and took a look uh, to make the point essentially that you just made, Austin, which is that. Uh, depending on the efficiency, the the new square footage could actually be fairly different than the existing square footage of any of the buildings. Um, and so this was, if you'll remember, this is when we were looking at, you know, does the do the lower school programs fit into the existing middle school needs when we were really still um, trying to investigate uh, whether or not things would be renovated rather than replaced. Um, so that being said, um, I just wanted to support that. And then otherwise, we broke it down 
uh, into total square feet per student. Um, and we looked at those as part of baseline recommendations uh, from the main school districts. And then we also looked at those in terms of, sorry, the MDOE guidelines versus the existing. And we were at, for the elementary and middle school, 167 square feet. Um, versus the MDOE guidelines of 140. And then for the high school, we had 286 square feet versus the MDOE guidelines of 185. And so that was sort of, again, highlighting that, you know, really you have to take into account the efficiency of the design layout in relation to how uh, schools are taught now versus when these schools were originally constructed. And if I may add to that as well, uh, to Austin's point, um, the square footage might be slightly larger here, only the, only because we're right sizing certain spaces, uh, take into account um, a, a performing arts center or an auditorium space that would be shared between the two schools, and also addressing the dining hall uh, concerns that are in the lower uh, in the pond in the pond cove school. Um, obviously, you wouldn't want to have a a brand new school constructed with the same footprint size cafeteria that you have now. Uh, so that would obviously have to expand. Thank you. So I have I, just a follow up, please. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to understand again from a footprint standpoint, are we expanding the footprint? Is the footprint about the same? There. Am I, can I interrupt for a second? James, are we not sure about that? Like that more detailed information will come in the schematic design. Is that correct? Like, that is correct. This it's, is a hypothetical situation, um, but it's, the schematic design will analyze more um, in detail enrollment and needs and the, pot the potential that the state is going to ask us to cover pre-K and and how do we allot for that? So um, th this conversation um, so, is but about- So Heather, I'm just trying to find out, they've shown picture. us a picture, they've shown us a picture, and I'm trying to find out what the footprint of what they're depicting is, even if it is just conceptual. I think they said they mimicked the same square footage here. They, they said they, they mimicked the square footage, but I'm trying to pin down the footprint, not just the square footage of the building, but the footprints. Okay, I, I, so the so, shape. So if I can, uh, uh, if, if, my, if my answer, I, I do understand what you're getting at, Marianne, um, because what we have been describing before was the inefficiency with the existing building footprint. Exactly. How, how, how it's, a long, it's a long stretch exactly. from one end to get all the way around to the other. And yeah. a lot of that is, um, is based on, because the building was, I mean, the building was constructed first off in the 1930s, and we had gone through that description of how it's been pieced together over the years to the 50s, uh, the 60s, uh, 1995, the 2004 expansion. And that kind of builds on and builds on. And what you're building on in that scenario and what you have now is you're just adding in, um, I'll say, living, occupiable space uh, for people who are actually in the building themselves, you're not adding a significant amount of utility infrastructure. So with the existing layout, uh, let me go back to. So you're showing like six finger fingers in the new layout. And I'm just trying to figure out the sprawl issue in the new layout versus the old. Yep, and so so with that, so the sprawl the sprawl issue with here, if we're looking at the the my my screen, all of the utilities and electricity, water, oil, everything comes into this corner of the building here. And in order to get this throughout the building, that's where a lot of your inefficiencies come from. Also, that it's a single it's a single floor, uh, it's a single story building over in the Pond Cove, over here with um, this particular building. And again, this is very preliminary. All classrooms have to have daylight. That's why we see a lot of the fingers poking out of the space, but the utilities would be centrally located so that you would have an even distribution of uh, heating, hot water, uh, electricity, um, cable runs for wireless internet and uh, other um, telecommunications that you have throughout your space because those are limited by physical distances as well. 
uh, and these this particular structure, obviously, it's it is not meant to be uh, a one said and done uh, final design here, but um, it, it would be more efficient and it would be more efficiently designed. It, right now, it is too it's it, it, we're too preliminary to, to tell exactly exactly what this building is going to look like. Um, this slide in particular, where I got to just right before I started to describe this is that yellow circle kind of describes where we all are at this point. Um, we've been talking about concept and schedule and budget, <laughs> uh, the collaboration of, of how all of this goes together. Uh, the next step in this phase would be to work out a schematic design in true cost estimate. That way you'd be able to go to uh, the, the residents of the town and say, this is how much we know with, with an amount of certainty is going to cost. James, I did want to sort of address that, uh, that uh, the efficiency of that concept sketch too. Um, it was roughly done so that each one of those wings corresponded to a grade level um, and accommodated all the classrooms in that grade level. And as James mentioned too, it takes into consideration daylight in each and every one of the classrooms. And you know, we, as we go forward, James referenced the schematic design do elaborate both daylighting models and energy modeling. Uh, and that gives us a huge advantage in the design to be able to manipulate that model and assure us that we're going to get an efficient, high-performance building. Uh, and that's essentially, um, uh, I guess we'll, we'll take any other questions that folks have at this point. Um, Cindy Boltz has her hand raised. Go ahead, Cindy. Hey, my question had to do with the historic portion of the middle school. I know in your in the earlier uh, sketch you showed, you talked about maintaining that portion. And then we get to the hypothetical and it looks like maybe the kitchen is in that space. I didn't know, you know when you're talking about maintaining it, what, um, you know, would that be keeping a standalone building there? Would that be kind of maintaining the facade of the building and, you know, incorporating it into what you're doing? Um, what, what happens with that piece if there is, if you are maintaining it? Absolutely. Uh, Sorry, sorry, James. Go for it, please. Okay, well, uh, we felt it was an important part. It contributes to the Scott Dyer Road. It has a strong presence, uh, but we did envision converting it to the kitchen and positioning the kitchen there has the advantage that all the services uh, can come in from Scott Dyer Road. And as you know now, there's a significant conflict between uh, food deliveries and the pathways of kids. And this sort of provides a clear unobstructed access to that kitchen without crossing any paths of the students. Um, you have an adequate uh, uh, drive that can accommodate a semi tractor trailer and can deliver food efficiently. And we also have uh, the advantage of having separate middle school and lower school dining rooms that are serviced by that one kitchen. And they each have an exterior dining area as well. So that was our thought about that. Um, you know, and as James made reference to, this is really a single building, um, you know, but it does have the advantage of a shared kitchen and a shared performing arts space. Uh, but each of the individual entries uh, to the lower school is controlled. It has its own identity and own access point, uh, own ad administration in that area. Same for the middle school. And there's a designated entry for the performing arts as well when you have the general public coming to a performance. And, and keeping, if you are using it in the kitchen or reusing that portion of the building, I know we talked about um, things like the slab and other things being less efficient in the older parts of the building. Um, and this I assume is the oldest part of the building. Are there any concerns about that in, in reusing that space? No, it's a pretty solid building. Uh, the floor slabs are pretty substantial. Um, there are some exterior envelope issues that uh, could be addressed. Um, and we would probably replace all of the windows to get a higher performance there. Uh, but, you know, kitchens notoriously generate a lot of heat. <laughs> so I think the biggest problem there would be the uh, uh, exhaust air and accommodating that and doing it in a sensitive way. Um, did that answer your question? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions? No. 
Um, I did have a question um, for James. When you went back to the timelines, um, I'm wondering if you can pull up that, yes, the first one. Um, it says that, sorry, I have to move my little screen here so I can see clearly. Bond support documents, um, preparation, June 2020, the bond vote um, in, a year later. Uh, so in looking to the next steps in the future, it would be in that year from June 2020 to June 2021 that the schematic design would be created and um, all the details would be teased out. Is that correct? That That is correct. And uh, Matt, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe the town requires um, it's a certain period of time for bonding and making sure all of that infrastructure is set up in place also for communication with the town as well, um, as far as uh, letting uh, all the residents know what is going on. The actual schematic design portion, um, and again, we're just using June 2020 as just a, um, a, line, a, a point in the sand in order to start a timeline from to, to make this pers give perspective to it. Um, if, if we're starting in June 2020, we would have the schematic design completed by the end of 2020. So we're looking at December 2020 or even November, depending November, December, early January. Um, that would be in place. You would have your number at that point. You would have a general idea of what the building would look like. And then between January and June would be, um, that, was, that would be more on the town side as far as preparing uh, the infrastructure for. Is that correct, Matt? Did I misspeak there? Uh, yes, uh, the only thing I'm thinking of is, uh, are you rotating forward the calendar by a year, though, versus because uh, June 2020 is in our rear view mirror? Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you Thank to goodness, me, right? <laughs> uh, my blood pressure jumped about 40 points, but otherwise, <laughs> the process is fine if you just add uh, six <laughs> <Yeah>. months to it. <laughs> We're already in it. You guys didn't know? Uh, no. Um, I'm in the, the COVID vacuum here, James. Sorry. <laughs> You know, it's fine. I feel like I'm still in March sometimes. Um, the purpose of that was just to just to set a point. And um, yeah. obviously knowing that, yes, June 2020 is is behind us. Got it. Um, but there would be no point. There would there would there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be the, it would be too fast if, let's say, this coming June, we were able to put it out to referendum vote the townspeople, let's say hypothetically, all approved it to have the time to, I thought there was the possibility to bond in the fall. Is that too fast of a timeline for the work for you, James? And is that not possible on our end, Matt? Is that just too fast? Does it take that year to do the work to get it going? I, I would think you might be able to shoot for Sorry, I got a Boston tail. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe November would work as a date uh, versus June because you, you know you do have that to fall back on as your uh, additional uh, a few months later yeah. as a, as a point. So you could probably get a good number of the details put together there and then and launch for a November vote, which could line up very well, I think. And would that be possible? for schematic design creation? Is that enough time from June to November in your expertise, James? That's pretty tight um, okay. to be honest, because we would need we would need to have um, those months. It, if we started earlier, like if it were in January or February, the, that could be a, a better possibility. But again, that's that's a um, those are those are big moves. And obviously, um, that's those are uh, um, so it takes yes. the, the, the short answer is yeah if june to november would be would be very tight to accomplish um but obviously january through november that is possible uh kaylin is, is there anything you wanted to add to that um uh maybe uh scott or austin could step in but if we had a commitment that the money was gonna you know come for that and and obviously if we're the if we're your team um I, I think we could pull it off, if, especially if we were able to start a, a few months early. Um, Scott or Austin or Julie, uh, uh, Julia, can you jump in? Yeah, I, I would agree with um, with James's remarks. It would be challenging, um, you know, and the dilemma is the 
more you invest in the schematic design and the more time you put in it, you can put a package together to your voters with more certainty. The more yeah. this is developed and the more thoroughly it is engineered and priced and vetted, uh, then you can put together a package with far more confidence uh, to the voters that it's going to work and it's going to come in on budget. Right. And my understanding, Donna, is that we we can't commit to a schematic design until we get our budget. Our passed. budget vote, which won't be until June. So, so there's, yeah. there's no way for us to start a schematic design before that time period. Yeah. And our and you have to remember that our our year starts July one. Right. So even if our budget is passed right. in June, the money is not available. The money's not available until July one. So, so the you may, reality you may be to look at, at June of twenty two then. Uh, and that would I mean that would line up traditionally with your normal school yeah. budget vote and you know other votes that take place. So that would give you a huge window and you can get all your ducks in a row at that point, as well as have plenty of uh, 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 details lined up to make sure it meets all the statutory requirements to get uh, uh, you know, the timing periods that we need to, to formally get the vote lined up. Mm -hmm. And you know, too, we've sort of discussed this before that it's, it's going to be a big grassroots effort, uh, you know, and it, you don't want to rush it. You want to make sure that you sort of lay the foundations and and inform um, the PTO, uh, the community at large, that we're starting this process and have a feedback loop. Um, and you know, that um, all of the different stakeholders feel involved in the project and informed about the project and you build this community-wide momentum um, to get this passed. Yeah. And uh, our, our job is, I think our job is to give you the tools to make presentations, the visuals, uh, you know, to, to meet with different groups, the Rotary Club and the PTO and everyone to build up that uh, grassroots foundation. I would say along those lines too, that there's a lot of value in not um, rushing that process or having that process even be perceived as being sort of a rushed process to fit it in. Just going back to the question of fall versus spring. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I would like, I see two people that have their hand raised. And so I'd like to call on them, but afterwards I would, I would love um, you all to, to maybe talk to us about the timeline and how, um, how we do our marketing. My understanding was that um, you all were involved in it and maybe Donna, if you know, or the experts, if you can just educate us all in the process of, um, how we decide which architect and engineers do this, um, who does this come out, just explain what comes next. But Valerie Devereaux had her hand raised first um, and then Susanna mazel hub All right, thanks. Um, and I guess this question goes out to James. I, I, I realize that the design is not complete yet and that's a big process, something we're looking at, but I was a little confused looking at that footprint of the new building because I remember in one of the presentations, what we talked about was that um, the less roof area you have, the more efficient the building is. And that's one of the problems with our um, buildings now. And that was really one of the reasons renovation re really wouldn't work because we had so much roof area. That was my understanding. And maybe that's completely wrong, but um, because there was so much running roof area. So I suggested one building and I realized this is two buildings that connect and become one building. But what I kind of envisioned was more of a um, less of a footprint building, possibly that could be built at one time um, at a lower cost where it would be K through eight and you wouldn't have the, um, the kids moving into the one building and then out of the other one and then into the other one, but we would just have construction on one building. It would have less of a roof line. It would be more efficient than what we have now. And it would be a lower cost because we don't have basically two buildings going in. 
what are your thoughts about that? Is that just not doable or is that something that um, we could talk about later on in a design context? Well, first, let me, uh, and thank you for your question, Valerie. Let me answer your question first about um, <clears throat> the, I'll say, call it the sprawling footprint. Um, it's a, uh, it, it appear, it, it does appear that way, but the difference between this building and the building that's currently in place now is that um, the foundations aren't varying between different structures. You don't have a thin foundation underneath a 1930s building or a 1950s building that's been, has been potentially cracking. There isn't a lot of uh, ability to get great insulation out of it, whereas a new foundation here would be constructed with the best possible R value as we can. Um, and that's, and with the single floor, the single, uh, a single story uh, building, say again, taking Panko for instance, you're attacked from every angle from the sides, you're attacked from the bottom with the, the cold elements of winter and you're attacked from the ceiling as well. You don't have any efficiency of having a two story building on there. Whereas in this situation, we would, any kind of future building would really avoid having that just sing, standalone single story structure. Uh, in addition to that as well, there are programming requirements, and this is more into Austin, uh, Scott and Julia's uh, realm of expertise, but there are programming, um, oops, I don't know why that's coming up there. Uh, everyone can still see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, there are programming requirements by the state that, I'll, that have to ensure that certain grade levels, uh, especially the younger levels, have to be on a single floor. They have to be on the single, um, on the ground, on grade. And so you also, you can't, you can't necessarily have a gymnasium or performing arts center or your kitchen or your dining rooms on the second floor. Those all have to be on the base level floor. Um, so already the, because of certain, um, because of certain spaces that you have to have in a school, your, your footprint is going to be large. Um, but it doesn't mean that you still can't build higher. And again, this is very preliminary design. Um, we don't, we don't, this, this very well could change, but we just wanted to show an example of what it could look like. But re rest assured that a building, even uh, a building looking like this, uh, that would be two stories in every direction, even though it looks that is um, footprint right, foot, footprint wise on the ground, uh, just as large as the existing building uh, is much more efficient and saves a lot more money uh, energy wise and energy consumption wise in the long run. Um, and to, to your second part of your question, um, I'm sorry, could you, would you mind uh, repeating it? Well, I was just looking at, is there a way that we could build it? Maybe it's three stories high and build it as one building rather than two phases to make one building so that it would possibly be a lower cost to that we could sell it a little bit easier to um, residents. Mm -hmm. Understood. And uh, Austin, uh, Scott and Kaylin, feel free to jump in. Um, on this right here, we're limited by uh, just available, uh, available green space on this particular campus. Um, with, the, with the existing school here now, um, there's very little space on this field to construct a dedicated K through eight building just in the small footprint of this athletic field. You would have to look, and I don't have a Google map in front of me, but you'd have to look towards the middle between the two, the existing high school and the existing Pankova Middle School. Um, and there are significant grade issues in the center of uh, in the center of the campus. Kaylin, uh, um, Valerie, if I could try to answer your question on the single uh, versus the sprawl. Um, one of the easiest ways to describe the thought process that we go through as designers is we create filters um, and the filters are generally uh, created by the codes. And uh, as, as Austin and uh, Julia have, have, and James have put forth is there's a requirement of which students have to be on the first floor. Uh, there's security requirements, you know, the, um, the active shooter type stuff that you worry about, how far people have to walk from an administration, how, how uh, guests will come into the school. Um, that's a filter. Um, and then, of course, there's the energy filter, which is, as we've been saying for, for a while now, is, is build up, uh, build, a, build a box. The best, you know, the most energy efficient will be a box multi-story. Um, 
And so you create all those filters and, and every, every layout that you come to, you put it down through the filters to see if it, to see if it meets the uh, requirements. Um, and and I, I know you're probably tired of hearing it, but it, we are very so preliminary with this layout and there's always a danger in showing anything. You know, it, it may have been better to stay with bubble diagrams, but that doesn't show much either. Um, I mean, it, it could very well be just uh, a, a box like you're saying that meets all those criteria with the center box that has, um, as Austin said, you know, the one kitchen serving two dining areas, which is very, very efficient. Um, and, uh, but, and then still all the other common spaces of, of theater and the other performing arts pieces. Um, so uh, again, if we, if we don't show you anything, it's hard to figure, hard to imagine. And if we show you a school layout, it, it, it prompts a lot of questions and we're just so preliminary at this time, it's hard. I do uh, also just want to add to the point James is making regarding available open space on the existing campus for a freestanding building. Um, so that line of thinking is, is really assuming that the students will remain in the existing buildings while the new building is being constructed. So the other possibility is that if that's not the case, if the existing site that the building is on is still the best site and you are doing a single building, not phased construction, you then have to relocate the students elsewhere, either off site or bring portables onto the site. And just taking a very preliminary look at the expense of portables during our previous investigation, just as a as a plug really for this effort, it was it, it was a six uh, or it, it was in the millions of dollars range. It was it was a sizable cost. Um, thank you, three three million. Kaylin is reminding me. Um, so I just wanted to put that consideration out there. It's not that it's not possible. Uh, it's it's just a it's a real um, I don't want to say a problem, but factor to contend with. And again, I'll we're, add we're, to please that ask we, me. Excuse me, James, but uh, we did look at different uh, alternative locations for a standalone K through eight building. And what we ended up, we, we do have the benefit of having the existing school occupied all during construction, but we end up with a new school in the wrong location. Um, and it, it could be positioned between uh, the current uh, Pond Cove and the high school, but then we end up with athletic fields on Scott Dyer Road that makes for a difficult site circulation. Uh, the current location on Scott Dyer provides middle school access, lower school access, service points that don't cross one another, and it's really a great location. So a standalone school could be built, but it would end up being in the wrong place. Thank you for that. Does that help, Valerie? Yeah, that that help that helps a lot. I'm just thinking of ways that we can yeah. um, sell this to um, our voters. Yeah, I know you're being creative. And I wondering, Deborah, those are really good questions too, and I think we would, as we go forward, I think we would work to address those. Uh, very good points. Uh, Susanna, your hand is raised and then Hope. Yeah, hi. Um, I think, Heather, you alluded that you wanted to have these questions or these things answered after this, these questions. Um, but in the spirit of um, next steps, if we're shooting for a, a, um, a June 2022 referendum, what has to happen on the school board side budget wise by June of 2021. That's just what I was wondering. I, I have a follow-up question to that, Susanna. Um, that is, is it the schematic design that would be have to go into our budget for this coming year before the bond vote? Is that- well, that's, that's the FY22 budget. Okay. So that would be the budget that we will begin working on in January. Right. right. And so the schematic design would have to be a part of that budget because we wouldn't have gone to bond yet. Um, and what's, the, what's the, the percentage of the schematic design? I forget. Typically 20, between 15 and 20%. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, Hope. Hi. Um, so I wanted to, just for my own um, edification, and I think to help everyone sort of zero in on, on what we're looking at, I think, and I, I don't think the presentation's over yet, so just note that. Um, essentially, we're, we're trying to decide between, right now we have option one and option two, and the schematic we're looking at, I mean, like you said, it, it might've been better to have the bubble, but ultimately we're saying, it could have been a, it could have been a ham sandwich on the on the on the slide. It doesn't matter. What we're talking about is either we're going to build one ham sandwich and then we're going to build another on a second phase, or we're going to do them all in one phase. Is my understanding. So it sounds like the difference between option one and two right now is do we a one is we go in phases with two different bonds, and we have a little bit of more downtime. In, um, we have students. Uh, in a construction zone for longer. And then option two is more one, one bond, we, we go for it um, and it kind of happens in, in quicker succession. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at. We're not talking, we're not, we're not making any decisions right now about layout or what, what happens with the old middle school. Um, so that's, and that's my understanding. And so to, if we were to say, the, the, the next gating factor is this committee makes a decision for its recommendation to the board. And right now, those are the two options we've talked about so far. Is that? Yes. Okay. And I also think, I don't think the presentation's over yet. And oh, wait, one last thing was, um, Heather, you mentioned the other point about um, what's the plan for marketing and, and, and discussing this with, you know, how do we present information? I think those are all super critical, but not tonight. Yeah. So I want to get yeah. everything we can on the table about what we're, what are, what is our decision before us? And so far we've seen option one and option two, and I don't think we're done yet. Yeah. I appreciate that sort of drawing us back in hope um, very much that um, I think there uh, are so many questions that we have through this. And I love that initial flow chart that James showed up and that explains how we're at the very beginning. And I think it is so important for us to remember our task that we are getting ready to make a recommendation. We've done a lot of work, we've narrowed it down. We've said we want new building, new buildings, ham sandwich as Hope said, whatever it looks like. Our task at hand is to say, now that we understand a rough time frame. obviously it's not completely accurate. There's a starting point in June, 2020 here that you know, it's already passed, but use this, this guideline of the, the timeline that we've been given um, along with the information that Matt has given us um, about bonding to decide as a group what our recommendation to the board is. And option one, again, is the idea of phasing it out and taking um, 10 plus years was my understanding to, to do this uh, work with time in the middle to sort of pay down part of the bond. Um, and then option two is more of potentially like six years is what it looks like to me. Um, and most of the paying down of the bond happens after the project. Um, and so that really is where we're at. That's really where um, the conversation, um, I would love to see the conversation go towards. I did want to have I did bring up the idea of what happens next so that people understand that there will be working of schematic design. There will be, um, you know, conversation about this in the school board budget, um, that there is a lot of planning um, and not to get caught in the weeds of what is ahead of us, but just to sort of give us a little perspective about that. Um, Susanna, you have your hand raised again. Sorry, just one more question in, in relation to just the, the details. If <clears throat> if we go, uh, if we pay 15 to 20% of the schematic design and you put that into the FY 22, bu 20, 22 budget, that's a lot of money, which would that go out to bond also? Because that isn't that, if I'm doing, I'm horrible at math, but wouldn't that be over a million dollars? Or do you think that would just be incorporated into the budget? I, 
Uh, this is Kalen. Uh, okay to take a swipe at that before so Matt does? Yes, um, thank you. I um, there's there are a bunch of ways to to do this. Um, when we first proposed the project a number of years ago, we had worked in a scenario where uh, a bunch of the the design dollars were actually in as part of the bond. Um, you're correct. It's uh, it's somewhere somewhere just over a million dollars for the for the schematic design um, to pull all the pieces together and, as Austin said, get an accurate cost. Um, and um, keep in mind, I think something James has said uh, all along is um, that um, that money comes out of the design, which is, and the design fee is usually uh, regulated by BGS as a percentage of the fund. That's a state, the state has guidelines for how much, you know, you charge for, for these various things. So you're just taking a part of that pot and putting it in advance to get the design done, to get the correct construction dollars to support the bond. Um, Matt, I don't know if there's a way to creatively do it so that the money actually gets paid for in the in the bond, um, or if you've done anything like that in the past. Uh, on occasion, sometimes I mean, folks have done bond anticipation notes as ways to to early fund something along those lines, or uh, there's there may be different ways to do that. Um, ultimately. It depends upon the speed at which the project is going to be launched, I think, is what you're looking at. If you were trying to do it in this year, you may be better to perhaps do a, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think my best answer I could give uh, on that would be, I'd have to get back to you on that and do some yeah, we research. Yeah, we need to do some research about what we were gonna do on our end too. Thank you. Our budget. Thank you. I've just trying to think things through. Mm -hmm. So um, it is about 7.55. Um, I am wondering if there's any more questions for the architects and the engineers. Heather? Yeah. Um, would you would you like us to step off for the remaining 30 minutes if there aren't any questions and let the board um, so I thought that worked well themselves. last time and that's where I was heading yeah sure. you're thinking um, thinking into my mind I just wanted to throw one more um, out there question I'm looking at the participants to see if there's another question about um, sort of this timeline and the big picture concepts um, and the difference between option one and option two. Can I just clarify one more time, James, that option one is the idea of phasing out where we pay back some of the bond in the middle. It's a longer time period with two bonds. Option two is this, the six year time frame, give or take, right? Where the payout of the bond is happening more at the end of it and we're doing one bond at the same time. Is that, do I have that correct? Correct. Option one are two sizable bonds yep. over time. Option yep. two is one large bond all together at once. Yep. Okay. The, the, the con of that obviously is you have more of the upfront, you have to pay for all of it upfront, um, but it is, all, it is yep. all done at once and is done as one project with no phasing in and on a shorter timeline. So I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, we have your number. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, Andrew <laughs> Andrew Patton has a question. Oh, he does. Uh, okay, Andy, I didn't see your hand raised, but go for it. Thank you for that. Like, I just got a question for the professionals. Can you get a little specific around where the economies of scales are going to come from, uh, from option two versus option one? Just sort of what the what, what's going to save the town essentially millions of dollars if we go to option two. James? Yeah, uh, yeah, go, go ahead and start. Uh, I, th I think, Andrew, the, uh, the real savings is, as Matt said earlier, and if, uh, if James could give you the option one bond cost and then the option two bond cost versus the, I'm sorry, <laughs> the two bond costs for option one versus the one bond cost for option two, 
Matt uh, could speak to the to the amount of savings because in both cases uh, we're proposing to build the exact same building. Um, the the reason that we first threw out the option of having two bonds for which is option one is depending on what your other town projects were, you might want to borrow a smaller amount of money and begin paying that off. And as that gets paid off, then buy the second, borrow the second amount of money. Uh, Matt already mentioned early on that there's significant savings in just biting it off early um, just for the, you know, just the normal uh, time value of money, if that's it. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. I think you did. The other question I had is there's really been no discussion about what the cost of the renovations is going to be down at the high school. Is there some number that you can assign to that? The numbers that we carried in our initial um, in our initial estimates when we published our uh, when we published this memo back in February it was about three million dollars. And again, that would be focused entirely on infrastructure and looking at systems in the building to keep them going uh, again for the next 15 years. Obviously, that would be looked at into a lot more detail uh, based on um, what the needs are, having the initial cost estimate come back for what this project is going to be to see if, you know, what other things can we do at the high school while keeping everything within, uh, within budget lines for you folks. Um, but we wanted to focus on the lower middle school here because uh, it seemed to be the uh, not saying that anything is a higher priority, but it needs the most work physically. Um, but the high school would not be left out of this process as is con in, in concurrent with any project that happens at the lower middle school. There would be project. There would be a project uh, that would go on at the high school to address a lot of the con critical concerns. Those just haven't been gone into detail like we have here with the lower and middle school. Uh, and really uh, briefly, um, just last month, uh, when we, uh, like a few, or two weeks ago rather, when we had our updated uh, memo we provided to you folks, uh, we, we gave just a three to five, we gave a 5% construction escalation on the estimated bond uh, that we're just, ba again, looking at very basic square foot numbers. Um, on the higher end, it's 45.1 million for bond one, uh, 48.3 million for bond two. And then um, for the, just the option two by itself, uh, the high end of that is 80.8 .8 million. Um, and then obviously it's the, the range is from 74 to 80. But again, that's a range that needs to be flushed out through a schematic design to know what this footprint will look like how many classrooms, how many spaces will be in there. This, this takeoff is based on the square footage of the existing building now, if you were to, rec if you were to try to build a, uh, an identical school building, which we will not, or whomever does it will not. What we can do, James, Heather. I just is, got uh, kicked out of the meeting. Oh, and you became the host. Yeah, James, you became so the host. So, can you go up? What? To the, oh, no. Okay. Because I got kicked out of the meeting. Can you go to the three dots and make me host again before you leave? Um, yes. And I do see Valerie Devereaux has her hand raised again. Um, if you could just take that before you all take off in case it's the question for you. Thanks, Heather. You. Oh. Valerie. I think you're breaking up, Heather. Yeah. I have a, just a quick question for you, James. Yes, Are Valerie. those numbers um, reflective of the new costs of- Maybe uh, make Donna the host. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, go, go ahead, um, go ahead are Valerie. Those, are those numbers reflective of the new construction costs? Because I know that you gave those numbers to us a while back and certain construction costs have uh, skyrocketed. Portland's having problems right now right. because of that. So are, would we really be looking closer to 90 or 100K um, rather than 80? I would hope not. Um, the, the numbers that we had given you folks back in February, those numbers we applied a 5% construction escalation to. So we have increased the numbers from February to what you saw in the, in the report and the memo, updated memo last month. Uh, but again, these are the, 
the basic square foot numbers that we have here is it, they can't be taken any to any further level of detail unless you have that schematic design where you're going down to um, pen to paper to see all the different rooms establishing quantities you can have in a quant with a schematic design you have your building footprints you can actually quantify the amount of steel you're going to have you can quantify the amount of concrete that you're going to need um, any kind of furniture tile things like that that way you can quantify those numbers and give you a much better representation of what that actual ac ac actual cost is going to be i i understand that i was just hoping that um mm -hmm. Since you you guys are working in the field and seeing this day in day out, that maybe five percent is a little bit low, um, based on your experience over the last um, six eight months. And from what I'm hearing, um, the costs are continuing to go up. So um, I don't know if that square footage number is still really accurate. But I I hear what you're saying. Um, just trying it's to figure out what our numbers might potentially be. Absolutely, and, and it, is, it is a very challenging, uh, it is very challenging to cost estimate these days. Um, I'm sure uh, Derek can, uh, can agree with us. It's, it's, it's a moving target a lot of times nowadays. We're just trying to find uh, accurate costs for just raw material. Um, we were trying to be as conservative as realistically possible. We're not, we're, we weren't trying to um, artificially inflate numbers just because of inflating them just for the sake of uh, uh the sake of the conversation we we're we put um considerable thought into uh what what this realistically could potentially look like okay thank you i have my video off to help with my um connection but i'm here can you hear me donna Yes, we can hear you. Loud okay, so that's why my video is off. Um, thank you um, to Julia and James and everyone. Um, what I can do, Heather, is um, I'll we'll email you the presentation after the meeting, and uh, I'll email it to you and to um, Jennifer, and um, you folks can distribute it as you like. And uh, actually, I think Derek Converse had his hand up. I see that right now. Go ahead, Derek. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what uh, Valerie was saying. I think there's a couple of things going in our favor. Um, one is that our current buildings are fairly inefficient. So on a square foot per pupil basis, I think um, uh, I think Lauren addressed, kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, our buildings, I think the state of Maine has guidelines in terms of what they would pay for square foot per pupil, if you will. Our buildings are actually quite a bit more, they have like you know, staggeringly more square footage per pupil than most schools would have. So that's one factor. So a new design, even if we kept the same population, we're not even talking about population for a moment. If you kept the same population, our new design by in theory would go down by a certain percentage in size. The second thing is obviously the population discussion. So if there is some portion that comes down again, that in theory could come down again as well. So they're the, I think to their point, the estimator's point is that they're looking at it purely apples to apples saying, you currently have say 200,000 square feet. We, based on a 200,000 square foot building, your price is gonna be X. When in reality, the new design may end up being 150,000 square feet, uh, that sort of thing. So I think that's a couple of things that go in our favor and yes, uh, prices have gone up. Um, they were a little crazy this summer. They have seemed to have tapered off a little bit. Um, so it's hard to tell, but I think 5% is still fairly accurate for this year. I would say if you asked me in the summer, I would have said, no, that's not accurate, but it seems to have come down. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. Okay, I guess if there aren't any other questions, we'll uh, we want to give you guys the maximum amount of time to speak uh, privately as much as possible. So, if there aren't any questions, thank you, James. Yeah, please text us if you need us. All yeah, right. we can we can always come back on. Just send us an email or, or shoot us a text message. Okay, thank you, Austin. Thank you very much, and happy holidays. Thank you, yes, happy holidays. Thank, Take you care. Yes, thank, thank you all of you. Yes, thank you all so much. Bye. Um, let's see.
how do I get out of here? Here it is. <laughs> Which means you should stop sharing a screen. And now we're all back. So now it's an open discussion. Um, and I'm not seeing people jump to raising their hands. Um, I will say that I feel like I have the ability to vote. Um, I feel like I don't, um, I don't, um, I don't need more discussion. Um, I thought that uh, that was pretty thorough and I have enough happening um, in, in my mind conversation. So I'm, I'm curious to know if there are people that feel like they're not prepared to vote. Derek, nope, he, he turned his hand off. Elizabeth is raising her hand. So I'm prepared to vote, but I just feel like we need to kind of reiterate what we're voting on and that of sort of thing. So I'm yeah. just going to try to recap. I'm going to go back to the beginning and I may need Phil to jump back on because Phil's point was, I think, perhaps most relevant because we're voting on, as Hope said, two ham sandwiches that are going to hopefully be the same ham sandwiches. Um, but it is how much do those ham sandwiches cost over the long run? And my understanding from Phil and Matt Sturgis was that um, phasing it over two bonds would be terribly more expensive. And then using one bond is, you know, looks like a bigger number up front, but really saves us money in the long run. Mm -hmm. And um, that's my understanding. We're still getting, you know, the two ham sandwiches. So. Yeah. Derek. Yeah, I, I think I just like to piggyback on that. I think Matt uh, had that great um, spreadsheet that showed, I mean, even if you had the same percentage at two and a half percent and you had two $40 million bonds, I think the numbers would have been like, I don't know, 240 and 240, but an $80 million bond would have been say 340 or something. It wouldn't have been the sum of those two. So that, I think that was just a good point of looking at it that way. Thank you. Heather could, uh, this is Kimberly, and yes. um, and I think in addition to um, that increased cost factor, just doing the two buildings separately, I, I think he, um, James had the high end um, at 45 and 48 for the two buildings separately versus 80.8 .8, um, for the one building. So we're looking at roughly like an additional 12 million there even if the um, interest costs weren't going to be higher. Okay. Susanna, you're muted. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm definitely clear on how um, I vote. Um, I definitely would vote for one larger bond. It, it not only saves money um, in the long run um, in, for multiple reasons, but I, I'm afraid of the risk of going into two phases, two bonds of not getting the second building done, not to mention the high school down the road. I just feel like this is just kicking the can into you know the next century. So I, I, I'm definitely for the larger bond for doing it all at once. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Hope. Um, I, I agree with Susanna. Um, I'm agree. I agree the, the, uh, all at once, uh, for the reason of saving, um, saving money on that. Um, I also think I, I agree that we, we, we can't afford to kick the can any, any longer. And I think that's what we've been doing for, for quite some time. And I don't mean we, anyone in particular, it's just, um, I think if, if we look, um, and also sort of, I want to sort of couch the, the bond number in everyone's mind, because I think this is something we're going to have to be, we're going to have to be selling it. So 
it, it's, it's not so helpful to look at what we have in debt today in relation to what we're looking at taking on. It's sort of what have we had historically and what do other towns do, similarly situated towns. So to look at Cape Elizabeth today, we're incredibly frugal. Um, and I think this is all information I took from you know, public documents. Um, our current debt to assess value ratio is 0.5, it's under 1%. Um, and so a similar town, Yarmouth, they're at 3.9%. So they have a much higher level of debt in relation to their assessed value. Um, notably, they just, they just passed a $52 million bond for their schools. Um, and if we were to be taking on a similar level of debt to put ourselves in the same class as Yarmouth in terms of debt to assess value, that would put us, we'd have a, um, a, an overall town debt level of, of approaching 90 million. So to look at us and say, oh, we, we only have, you know, we're down at 0.5%, we're so great, we're, we're doing great, and we are doing great, that's fantastic. But to look, I think we need to look at it in the larger scale of like, what is it, what is a reason, what's reasonable to be spending on our, on our schools? And we may not have been in this situation where we have to take such a big chunk of debt today if we've sort of done it in earlier phases, but I think every day and every year that we pass it on, it's just going to become more expensive and it'll become a bigger number and harder to swallow. And I don't wanna pass that on to the, to the residents 10 years from now to, to, to carry on. So for that reason, I think you know, option one is the right one and it's our job to, to that's, get that's it done. That's option two. Sorry, option two, you're right. <laughs> option two, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, all at once, thank you. Uh, Cindy Boltz. Yeah, I would I would agree with the comments on on the financial pieces as well, and going with option two. And to me, also really significant about option two is just getting it all done at once and minimizing the disruption to our students and to the community, um, to drop offs, to everything else that's happening while the, our schools are a construction site. I mean, I just that twelve years for option one just can't get out of my head. That's a a child's entire school career that we would have a construction zone there. And I, I think that's a significant uh, reason um, to go with option two as well. Anyone else? Okay, so I'm not seeing other hands up. Um, and so therefore I'm gonna do the same similar process as, as last time um, and we'll vote. Um, I'm gonna do a roll call. Oh, Kimberly Carr raised her hand. Go ahead, Kimberly. Um, I, I too am a proponent of um, the second option of doing it all at once. And a big piece for me is the high school. I think we had started um, the discussions looking at maybe doing the high school renovation first is really sort of our, our flagship school in the town. Um, and, um, and obviously the thinking has switched, but um, I, I think if we go with option one, um, any renovations and improvements to the high school just get pushed further down the line as well. Um, and I think the high school really serves our town so well and, um, and needs some serious updates. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a roll call. I just wanna, I, I do think it's confusing because option one is actually the two bonds. Option two is the one bond. Um, so just keep that in mind. We might wanna think it's different than that, the opposite. But option one, again, two bonds, okay, a longer period of time. Option two is the one bond, all done at once, a faster time frame. Elizabeth just raised her hand. So maybe um, instead of asking people which option they're voting for, just say, gonna do a uh, roll call on option, yeah. So that- bond is one bond. Yeah, so that way they know what they're voting for. Okay, that means I have to think more. 
That's right. But I can do it. I can do it. All right. So that's a good suggestion to make sure that we don't have any confusion. Um, I'm going to ask you to say two bonds or one bond when I when I call your name. So Heather Altenberg, I would like the one bond. Um, Susanna Mazel Hubs. One bond. Thank you. Um, Andy Patton. One bond. Caitlin Ramsey works for the school. Carla Bryant. One bond. Oh, it got confusing. Um, it's switching around on me. Okay, Cindy Volts. One bond. Don't anybody turn your screens on or off because then it switches it around, please. <laughs> Derek Converse. One bond. Elizabeth Seifries. One bond. Hope Straw. One bond. Jen Grimek. One bond. Kimberly Carr. One bond. Nicole. One bond. DJ. One bond. Tim Thompson. Tim Thompson? Um, Valerie Devereaux. Um, one bond. Um, and people did move around a little bit. Did I call in everybody? No. Uh, Marianne Lynch, somehow you moved up to the top. I was looking for you, Marianne. I oppose both bonds. And I hope that whatever report there is will be clear. Um, my concern is that option two is at least 33% more than option three, which was voted off the island last month. So I am opposed to both options one and option two. And I also think that both options one and two are not as environmentally responsible as option three. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other mm, here's a gallery. members of the community? Heather? Yes, Heather, there you are, Tim. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Okay. Uh, so I would, I would vote for the two bonds. Okay, thank you for that, Tim. And did I miss anybody else? Did you get Phil? Phil is not on. Phil um, mentioned that he had to um, oh, okay. for another meeting and he was going to try to come back on if he had the time, but um, he had to leave. So he's not present with us right now. Okay. Um, well, it looks like the majority is for the one bond recommendation to the school board. Um, so I want to thank you all. Are there any final comments? Elizabeth, do you have your hand raised? No. No. Okay. Yeah, there's you Tim. Can, it, here, the, can you hear me? It's Tim Thompson. I can, Tim. I can. Go ahead. What? One of the concerns that I have, and now that we've made a decision on how we're going to move forward, um, 
when we started this process, we had some security issues at the schools and we had some red flag issues that were identified in the study. Um, we haven't heard too much on this whole, whole process really from any of the principals, but uh, I, I, would, I would like to somehow understand, have, are the schools secure at this point? Have we been identifying those areas? Have some of the, I know, in, I know Donna's had uh, them focusing on some of the, I know we've accomplished getting rid of some of the red flags that were identified, but are any of those things, are we able to, uh, to confirm for the parents out there that the schools are s secure now? Uh, and could we get some kind of a list moving forwards that, that this, this study that we put together to begin this process that, that we've been knocking off? Because not that we're not going to have a shovel in the ground for a couple of more years. And especially at the high school, we're going to, that's going to, there were a lot of red flags at the high school, but we're going to be able to identify and put in the budget some capital improvements to get the high school red flags at least taken care of for Mr. Shedd. And then is there some, are the, are the principals, I know they're all on tonight, are they, are they all comfortable with where we, what we've been able to accomplish uh, I know in our early meetings when parents were able to come in, there were a lot of parents, in fact, I think Derek was one of them, they, they expressed some real concern about the safety of the kids. And uh, I know we're kind of way into this process to be looking at some of this, but as we're going to be a couple of years down the road, could we identify some of those, get some of those knocked out and maybe include some of that money uh, that is, doesn't necessarily, it's not a big enough deal that we need to get it bonded, but could we, could we continue to move forward on some of those, so. Donna, do you want to speak to that or do you want me no, to? We, we do continue to work, um, move forward on those, Tim, and we, we um, uh, Perry continues to identify um, those items that we can work on. And I know that he's knocked off a lot of those, um, not all of them, but a lot of those on the list of red flags. So we do continue to work on those. And um, every year at the beginning of the year, Perry uh, reports to the board on the projects that were done over the summer and continues to report on the projects. We have um, a lot of ventilation projects on the board right now that will be, be starting really soon. So um, yes, we do continue to work. You know, the, the entryway at Pond Cove is still the entryway at Pond Cove and, um, you know, those doors are locked and um, we continue to monitor closely uh, who we're letting in um, to those buildings. And uh, so I, I think we're, we're safe, as safe as we can, um, as, as safe as we can say we're going to be. Um, but we can, we do continue to work on those things and to work on um, keeping our buildings safe. And Donna, do you want to talk about what's coming up next week um, on the agenda about the plan? Obviously not the details because that's confidential, but that every year? Well, every year, we... our emergency, yeah, every year our emergency management plan has to be updated and it has to be uh, approved by the board. So that is on the agenda for, um, for next week. So we continue to work on that as well. And we actually we added a new pandemic section to that emergency management plan. So, um, so that will be on the agenda. Does that help Tim? I mean, I don't think we're gonna be able to fix every red flag that is out there, but um, we're definitely working to chip away um, things that were um, that were mentioned. Elizabeth, you do your hand raise now. It looks like I do just um, I wanted to respond to Mr. Thompson because um, the safety and security um, upgrades are going to be, I think, major drivers um, to help the community understand why we need this project. Um, I, I hear Donna really talking about how care we're being as careful as we can be. <laughs> but we have we cannot do what we need to do with our operating budget. These are you know multi million dollar kind of projects that would have to be renovations to current buildings, which is why we need you know we're, we want to move on this process of um, you know our new buildings because 
you know, these would be bonds that we would have to take out. Um, they're major projects we've had. And Perry, I hope I'm, I've heard Perry talk about it so many times. I hope I'm doing him justice, but that, that these, you know, we've done what we can do, but we can't move the middle school um, office any closer to, to create the kind of, you know, kind of airlock that you walk into at the high school and can't get into the, the rest of the high school without taking a, a little detour into the main office. You can't do that in the elementary school and you can't do that in the middle school. So um, I know exactly what Mr. Thompson is talking about. And sadly, no, we can't do that um, without this vote that we took tonight. Right. Well, thank you everyone again for your time, for um, your deep listening and thoughtful questions and responses and deliberation here. Um, I hope you have a great night, a wonderful holiday, um, and thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Bye everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.